So kicking things off for our third session of the day, we have the wonderful Cindy Carsten. Now, Cindy is also known as Cynthia and graduated from the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine and then completed a shelter medicine internship at Colorado State and then a shelter medicine residency at UC Davis. Currently, she's the Director of Outreach with the UC Davis Correct Shelter Medicine Program and is also the lead veterinarian for the Sacramento chapter of the Street Dog Coalition and is a board member for Mercer, Mercer Veterinary Clinic and Compassion Without Borders. Dr. Carsten's interests include teaching and mentoring undergraduate and veterinary students, interns and residents, coaching shelter staff through online boot camp and other interactive formats, and providing accessible, affordable veterinary care to everybody who seeks it. And she also continues to work to understand her role and that of animal shelters in increasing awareness of social justice issues and implementing policies to bring about change. So welcome now to Dr. Cindy Carsten, who is talking about shelter medicine, what it is, why do we need it, and what is the future? Okay, no, especially after lunch, doesn't everyone need a little fireworks? Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming back after your lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. I will try and keep this uh, lively-ish. <laughs> I know this hour is tough for everyone. Um, and I did want to start um, today by acknowledging the Ugem the language speaking people who are the traditional custodians of this land, as we have learned. Um, and I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging as they hold the memories, culture, and traditions, and hopes of all Indigenous people. OK, so uh, Simone did a great job of introducing me professionally. Um, but me uh, personally, I was born, raised, did my undergraduate studies at university. Um, in Madison, Wisconsin. So as a kid, I did not move around a lot. Um, my first big move was um, I did a year abroad during university to Zimbabwe. So I moved to Harare, Zimbabwe. That was like my first big move. Um, I currently live in California with three small dogs, one larger dog, um, which is over the city limit. So I am a, well, break the rules. Um, I live with my partner. Turns out I love running. Um, I also love to travel, um, I love to be outside, I really like podcasts, not making them, but listening to them, um, love plants, and I love to geek out on anything plant-based, baking, cooking, consuming, um, and um, turns out I'm a learner, <laughs> keep learning, uh, never, never know it all. So I want to spend this time with you all today telling some stories some stories about shelters, uh, where they've been, where they're going, stories about shelter medicine, veterinary medicine, and then how we, uh, collectively, we interact with our communities. Um, and that's me. That is me eight years ago on this stage. Uh, in 2015, I was honored to be invited to speak at the G2Z conference. Um, were some of you here? Yeah. <laughs> um, I got to introduce folks to the Million Cat Challenge. I talked about uh, managed intake, capacity for care, optimizing length of stay. I got to do a full um, day workshop. It was, uh, it was lovely. Uh, turns out I was eight years younger. That happens. Uh, we age. Uh, it was a time when I could still use contacts to see. Uh, I hadn't yet discovered that I loved running. Um, and I had a really deep love uh, and a staunch commitment to what happened at shelters. And I wanted to do everything that I could to reduce any suffering and harm that was associated with them. And I was sure. I was so sure I knew exactly what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, so we'll get back to that. Um, it was also a time when I had yet to come to realize um, 
and really appreciate the fact that we are all shaped by the systems in which we live in, in which we work in, and the experiences that we've all had. So all those systems, all those experiences, they show up in how we think, they show up in what we value, they show up in what we believe, they show up in what we experience, and most importantly, they show up in how we shelter. But over these last eight years, as I continue on my journey, um, I have and I continue to acknowledge and better understand these systems in which I live, in which I work, and in a way, it's actually been a weight that's been lifted off of me because it's provided a lot of clarity. And it also has been and continues to be uncomfortable, sometimes extremely uncomfortable, and it has challenged much of what I was so sure about and what I thought was actually even inevitable. And so in a recent podcast I was listening to, because again, I love podcasts, my favorite podcast, Hidden Brain, uh, there was a recent episode where they were talking about contradictions and how as people inevitably we live often in contradictions. And the point that they made was that when we're certain, we don't pay attention. I was like, whoa, I'm really certain at times. <laughs> so my journey continues to be recognizing and continuing to have curiosity. So thank you, Diane, for reminding us of that amazing tool and rethinking so much of what I thought to be true. So let's go on some uh, journeys, journeys. Okay, so some of you may remember the 70s and 80s, some of you that may seem like ancient history, but regardless, it was a time of recognizing that animal sheltering is a thing. It is a, it is a field that deserves training, that deserves professionalism, professionalism, yeah. Um, uh, and where people can develop um, and continue to work on expertise, not necessarily be experts, Mike, um, and commit to really improving the lives of animals and people in their community. So software started to be developed that was especially for shelters. Um, we had professional organizations being formed. Um, there was an increased emphasis on spay and neuter, or if you will, desexing. And so this really, really kicked off what we now think of as the animal welfare industry. But this is a really good question. This was a question that was posed in JAVMA by a vet student of like, okay, that's all well and good, but what are we doing about the number one reason that animals are dying? The idea that they're seemingly unwanted. Really good question. Um, so in 2000, the UC Davis Cret Shelter Medicine program came to be. Um, it is the program where I got to be the sixth resident. Um, and um, this was our approach back then. Uh, Kate Hurley was the first resident of the program. She's now our current director. And she would talk about URI, so sorry, cat flu. Um, because it was endemic in shelters. And so she talked about it a lot. Uh, she talked about it a lot, a lot, because <laughs> it was a huge problem. Um, it was, it meant that cats really suffered when they came into shelters, and it usually meant that they didn't leave alive. So uh, we talked about it at nauseum. Um, but that wasn't solving our problem. Um, the research was still showing us that a cat ending up in a shelter, if they were there, Still at two weeks, they had an 80% chance of getting sick. Um, and I remember during my internship that at the shelter I was working at, it wasn't a question of if cats got sick, it was just when. So it was just sort of, we had normalized it. We had normalized that cats coming into shelters got sick. So time to stop talking, time to take some action. So um, got money to do a research project. Because um, 
we had some ideas about what was causing it, but we, we needed to show it on how we could avoid it so that it wasn't inevitable. So we got to do this fun research project. Shelter Medicine is all about fun research because we wanted to find out what impact, if any, does cage size, so their living environment while they're in the shelter, um, what impact that has on cat stress and thus cat flu and thus how cats leave our shelter. So cage size project. We did it at our local shelter um, with cats, adult cats that came in that they could be handled because we didn't need to weigh them. And they were randomly assigned to either a large cage or a small cage. Uh, the small cage was a traditional what we call two by two. I don't know what that is, a metric. <laughs> um, it's not big. You all probably have housing similar to this. Um, we would give the cats a hiding box, a litter box, food and water, not much else, um, not much room to lay down. Um, and then the larger ones, it was compartmentalized, so there was a separate toileting area, separate from where they can eat and sleep. Um, stretch out a bit. So the cats would end up in one of these two. We collected data. We did a behavioral stress score. We looked at their appetite, how much were they eating. We weighed them every week. We recorded if they got sick or not and what their outcome was. And OK, to be fair, we kind of knew what we would find. Um, but the impact was way more than what we thought. So ooh, I get to use the firework here. Um, a stress score of three it's just sort of like your average run-of-the-mill ambivalent cat, so not super excited to be alive, not super stressed, so just sort of being a cat. So that's what three is. The cats that were in the um, larger cages compartmentalized, about by the second day, they were starting to relax and they got below a stress score of three. Our poor friends who got put in the smaller cages, even after a week, they never reached that. Hence, why cats who stay in shelters longer than the seven days. So they're probably already starting. Their herpes is like, yeah. And that's why at two weeks, you'll start to see them getting sick. Um, you can also see that it also meant if they had to live in the smaller cages, unlikely that they were to leave alive. Many more cats were euthanized probably because they got sick and they also couldn't show who they were because they were stressed out. So shelter medicine invented the portal. Um, the, this is an example of one of the very first portals. It's just made out of PVC pipe. One of our veterinarians uh, came up with this. Um, and it means, it meant the difference between staying healthy and death for cats. Like a pretty exciting thing of just cutting a hole in cages was saving cats' lives. It also changed the experience of people working in shelters. Now they could clean. It was much easier and much less stressful on everyone. And it meant that our cats were leaving, um, which is also really great for folks who work in shelters, not having to euthanize them. And so we did. This research led to us working with Shoreline to make these commercially. Um, I hope many of you have these in your shelter. If not, talk to me. Um, we've also gone on to make the puppy portal. So it's a larger portal for small dogs and puppies. So every animal deserves to have compartmentalized housing. Okay, so super fun things that we were doing um, in shelter medicine uh, to improve the health of our animals. And we, um, we really like to drive points home. So we did another big research project that looked at nine different shelters across the United States and uh, the incidence of cat flu ranged greatly between them. Some of them didn't have any cats getting sick. Some of them had all the cats getting sick and then everyone else varied in between. There were 49 different factors that we looked at about what the difference could be between this that was causing such a large range. And the two biggest ones, who wants to guess what the first one was? You all said cage size, right? Yes, because <laughs> we proved that point. Again, 
So it was. Cage size was the biggest thing, at least eight square feet, preferably car compartmentalized. I'll, I'll get that in a metric, I promise. Um, the, other, the other biggest factor was how many times a cat moved within the first week. So how many cage moves they made. Fewer cage moves or zero cage moves meant, meant the cat stayed healthier. So it's super stressful for us to be moving our cats even for daily cleaning. Um, so we want to avoid that and we also want to give them room. So that is how we keep our um, cats healthy. We're like, we've done it. We have cracked the code on URI. Awesome. So this was also a time when we were starting to see textbooks dedicated to sheltering, shelter medicine, behavior in shelters, because we were starting to have answers. And with more veterinarians going into shelter medicine and shelter medicine residencies, we had people to share this information. Um, so we wanted to get it out there, helping people with their operations in animal shelters. Um, and it was working. It was working. We were seeing way fewer animals being euthanized in shelters, which was awesome. We were finally feeling like we were doing something about the leading cause of death of dogs and cats in shelters in the States. So this was great. Then um, we had fewer animals dying in shelters. So now it was always important to us the well-being in shelters, but now we went all in on that. Um, so this is also new since last time. This is my research project um, that I did for my board certification. Um, I wanted, for myself, I wanted a better understanding of capacity for care so that I could share it with others. Because remember, I was sure. I was really sure I knew what I was talking about. Um, so this was my research project that was with three shelters in Canada. Um, and we had a lot of recommendations that were a means to an end, so things to achieve capacity for care, such as managed intake, double compartment housing, because usually when you do that, you decrease the number of kid housing units that you have, so you're just going to drop the number of animals in your care. Talking about having waiting lists for animals who need to be surrendered, diverting cats to clinics so they can just have surgery if that's all that they need. So all of these things as a means to an end of achieving your capacity for care, improving welfare and outcomes, and it worked. My research project showed that it worked for some cats in shelters in some situations, um, but it left out something really important, um, something that I didn't fully realize at the time. Um, so, but I kept talking about capacity for care. Uh, I talked about this a lot probably talked to some of you about this a lot. Um, and I talked about this particular fact in an effort to help with perspective when we're feeling really, really overwhelmed um, and we get into a funk of feeling like the whole world sucks. Um, and so I would remind people that many people in your communities never need the shelter. What I realized though is when I said that, I was talking about people who look like me. I was talking about people who live like me. I was talking about people who don't need the shelter because they have plenty. They have privilege, they have plenty of safety nets that they don't ever need the shelter. I was leaving out, this number leaves out, all the people that need our help that we're not reaching. We've heard about this morning was <laughs> full of all the barriers that are in place between people and us, our communities and us. So, okay, starting to learn. Um, I also thought numbers were sexy, or what was it? Sexy, ooh, sexy numbers. I did a lot with sexy numbers. I did a lot of math. Um, oh, <laughs> she did my math for me. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so doing math to help us determine our capacity for care, and one of the things that I would uh, talk about, some of the math that I did, was specifically about adoption-driven capacity. So that is how many cats or dogs, sorry, this tends to be a, used to tend to be a bigger problem for cats, but how many animals they have up for adoption 
if you want to reach a certain amount, like if you have a certain number that you, certain length of time that you want animals to be up for adoption based on your rate of adoptions. So like, let's just say you adopt out 45 cats in a month, that's one and a half a day. I realize you're not cutting cats in half, it's an average. Um, so if you have a target adoption length of stay, so you only want cats waiting seven to 10 days for adoption, what is it? You do this math, there you go. At this rate, if that's how many, if that's how long you want cats to stay, you should only have 11 to 15 cats up for adoption. Seems pretty simple. I was like, this is so straightforward. Um, I missed a really important factor in this. Because for a really long time, I thought that, oh, son of a, wrong button. Okay, sorry. I thought that this was really fixed, right? I thought that, again, people who looked like me, people who live like me, there were only so many that were going to shelters to adopt. So this, in my mind, was very fixed. And I was like, okay, well, the only way you're gonna get this to go up is to shorten your length of stay. Again, I was missing all the barriers that were keeping this number where it was. There was likely way more people, as we learned this morning, there are lots of people in Australia who want and plan to obtain pets. There's a lot that we can do to increase this number, because we do a lot to keep the number where it is. OK, so I am still learning. Um, we loved this analogy. I use this all the time, the coffee shop line. Um, again, if we don't increase the rate of our outcomes, simply making the line longer, so having more cats up for adoption, having more animals up for adoption, all it does is mean everyone waits longer. So we would talk about decreasing the number in line as the most powerful way to decrease the length of stay. Mm, I might have been wrong. <laughs> Turns out we could also increase the rate of our adoptions. We could do way more adoptions by making it way easier and being way more inviting for people to come in and adopt. Um, I would also try and explain it this way. Um, I would try to explain that this wasn't a people problem, that the things we get criticized for on social media many times are unfair. It's not a people problem. It's not like we all go to work and be like, yeah, I really want to suck it up today. I really want to make things um, bad. I really want to not be able to do my job. Um, not how most of us work. Um, and this is true. This is true. Um, it is a situational problem. Uh, the problem with stopping at that conclusion, though, is it's incomplete. Um, it is. Um, a situational problem when we set ourselves up to only have two and a half minutes per animal. Like, how is that going to go well? How is that going to work out for us? Of course we're going to miss microchips. Of course things are going to get missed. Um, that's just not a sustainable way to, um, to manage our shelters. So yeah, it's going to look like we don't care. Yeah, it's going to look like we don't know how to do our jobs. So we need to avoid this. Like, what is it going to take that we don't end up in this situation and it can be better? So, um, as, as I continued uh, to do this work um, and as shelter medicine continued to evolve, as we talked more about people in shelters and the importance of all of us, and how that is just as important as the animals that are in there. Because um, this work is hard. This work is really hard. It's trauma-inducing. Um, we often have expectations, are expected to do things at a level that is much higher than the resources that we're given to do them. And what tends to make up the gap is suffering, suffering of animals and suffering of people. 
um, compromising one of those two things, the well-being of animals or the well-being of people. Like, we have to stop doing that. We have to stop having expectations that are way higher than our reality. Um, because that leads to this um, um, moral distress. It's a very profound source of stress for people who are drawn to the service industry, all of us as civil servants. Um, and it's really well documented in health professionals, especially our nurses, our human nurses, because um, it happens. This is what we feel when there's a really wide gap between the care that we want to provide, that we know we should provide, but we can't because of the circumstances that we're in. And um, continuously doing this to ourselves, to the people we work with, um, is really harmful. It also, leads us to look for someone to blame for our own stress. And we're willing to point the finger at just about anybody because we don't want to have to keep going through this. So I was at a point where I was like, why? <laughs> why do we keep doing this to ourselves when when I have shown through my research that capacity for care works, that if we work within our resources, if we work within our means, animals do better, people do better, but it wasn't happening. I was like, what is it? What am I missing? So I asked a colleague of mine, someone I had worked with for a long time when she was at a few different shelters, and I was like, why are you different? <laughs> why do you fight for it so hard? Why have you achieved it? What is it that drives you to keep working towards uh, capacity for care? And uh, this was her response. Uh, and it hit me like a really big punch to the gut. Because we had talked about this as a program. We had talked about it, but we sort of talked around it but we hadn't really talked about it. Because if we don't talk about the root causes of why we are where we are, why we are experiencing what we're experiencing, it's never gonna happen. We're never gonna be at our capacity for care. Whew, whew, that's a big one. Um, because this is what is happening has happened, continues to happen, um, especially when we're enforcement and service in many communities. Um, there's a unidirectional flow of animals. They come from our more vulnerable areas and they go to our less vulnerable areas. We keep moving animals one way. They come in from one area and they go to another. Um, so are you all familiar with the HSUS Pets for Life program. Um, it's a really great program. It's, it's been around now for quite some time, but it's a program that is on the ground in neighborhoods, specific neighborhoods that have been identified as high shelter intake areas in an attempt to decrease the intake that's coming from those areas. So going around and asking people, what is it that you need for help with your animals? because we don't want them to end up at the shelter, as you probably don't want them to end up at a shelter. And the folks who receive help through this program aren't going to shelters to get their pets. Most of them aren't going to the shelter at all, even if they needed help, which they do, as demonstrated by this program, and they're certainly not going there to adopt. They may have tried, but only 3% were actually successful. So, whew, okay. Um, and we know from a lot of research that has now happened, um, because research is looking at things much broader than just cat flu now, which is really exciting. But we know that a lot of the reasons, and you all have expressed it this morning, that a lot of reasons animals are surrendered is actually owner-related issues financial difficulties, difficulties finding housing. It's much more common than an actual animal-related problem. 
So this is a recent study from Canada. Um, it was looking at animals who were surrendered to the BCSPCA. So the BCSPCA is in British um, Columbia. They have, I think, 21 shelters throughout the province. And they found the exact same thing that animals, especially puppies and kittens, the majority were coming from areas of high vulnerability and going to areas of low vulnerability. So unidirectional flow of our animals leading to why our shelters are full. So shelter medicine, veterinarians, I would like to hope that we have gone from being late adopters, I'm speaking for myself, uh, to being leaders in recognizing the importance of our community and our community-based practices, um, that this is what it's gonna take to keep animals healthy. Um, and what can we do to help them and help people in the first place to keep them out of our shelters? Um, and either, and if they do come in, getting them back to the homes they came from or at least the neighborhoods that they came from. Um, and I believe this, I do believe that we all truly wanna help our communities, um, the people in our communities, but we also need to determine what that means what is the actual impact that we're trying to have and which of our actions are actually achieving that? Um, which ones are we doing that are actually getting in the way of helping? We need, we need to evaluate both of those. So research is looking different. It's really exciting. This is a whole um, um, journal that is uh, recognizing um, how we can reimagine animal sheltering. Um, it's really important to us that, so this is an open access. All of our research that we do now um, through our program and through a lot of the programs, they're in open access so that everyone can access them. Um, it's, it's frustrating when you have to be part of an academic institution to access research, so we make sure um, all of it is open access. There's a link to this particular journal in uh, my notes for this. Um, and I am no fool about money um, that I'm asking you to do what seems like more. Um, this was a slide I put together um, when I did a webinar for G2Z last year. Um, this is information that came from the Australian Pet Welfare Foundation, their inquiry into um, feral and domestic cats. I know I wasn't supposed to say that word, but they put it in the name. Um, so they did a, a, a cost estimate of what it costs to um, trap a cat, pick up a cat, care for a cat in a shelter. Okay, well, if you're a shelter that's taking in 5,000 cats a year, and if you're only, yay, getting out half of them to a positive outcome, you're spending a million to three and a half million dollars to do that. What could you do instead? We could help a lot of people and a lot of pets with that kind of cash. So just something to think about is um, it's not necessarily doing more, it's doing different. Um, it's also really exciting how many opportunities are coming up for our future vets so that they can experience this in their training, early in their training. In fact, students are going to vet school for this exact reason um, because they wanna work with all pets. They wanna work with all people. They want to increase access to veterinary care to everyone who seeks it. So these didn't exist, these programs didn't exist when I went to vet school. It's really exciting um, throughout the United States, um, in Canada. Oh, I'm gonna, full disclosure, I didn't look at Australia. If you guys are doing something cool, let me know. Um, it is also why our program, our shelter medicine program, just closed our grant cycle um, that focuses on removing barriers. Um, to have the systems be different um, because this is actually what we're gonna do to keep animals healthy, uh, to keep people healthy, and to keep our communities healthy. So I haven't thrown these out. I still use these textbooks because medical care and maintaining the well-being of animals that enter shelters is important. It's absolutely important. It's just that I've added these books. 
I've added these learnings because they're just as important to the work that we're doing and to the impact, especially if I want it to be different. So I also, I am board certified. Um, it's something I'm really, really proud of. Um, and I'm even more proud of it now because shelter medicine has recognized. Um, I really like the definition that we came up with. It's that shelter medicine is about providing population and individual care, but it's to every animal that's at risk in our community. It's not just the ones that end up in the shelters. Um, it's for client owned and it's about ensuring that everyone in our communities has the access to care um, that they're seeking. So, um, we have a lot of challenges, which means we also have a lot of opportunities. Um, and I hope, as Mike said this morning, that we take this opportunity to reaffirm our values of respect and compassion for all people, for all animals. Because y'all are leaders. And being a leader doesn't mean that you have to know everything. Because remember, if you're certain, you're not paying attention. But it does mean that you commit to showing up. It means that you commit to listening with deep respect, even when there's disagreement on that bus, right? There's gonna be disagreement. It's about being willing to be uncomfortable and also freeing yourself to rethink what we thought we knew so that we can go beyond what we actually thought was possible. So I hope that you will continue uh, to find curiosity uh, with me. Thanks. <laughs>